Now this is tape two of an ongoing set of tapes that we're using to demonstrate blade axe oak. We're going to try to cover steps three and four dealing with the application of silver, using silver as a filler, as a medium for finding flaws in the paintwork. Now the first thing I want to discuss is the mixing of the product. And one of the easy ways to mix if you're, if you're not a skilled person at mixing for spraying, or if you don't have a lifetime of spraying material to know about, there's a couple of basic rules. Number one is you can take the can, and you'll notice that Rolex Silver has a very high pigment content. It usually all settles at the bottom. So what you want to do is shake the can real well through a screwdriver, some medium stir it real well. Empty that can into a larger jar or can, and then you want to fill the whole can with Brodax thinner. Pour that into the can. Now that would basically give you a 50-50 mix at that point in time. And once these two are combined, you're going to have a 50, that's what I refer to as a 50-50 mix. That's still going to be just a little bit on the thick side. What you're going to want to do, and it depends on conditions where you are. In Florida where it's humid, you're probably going to want to add 10% retarder. If you see paint fogging up, you're going to want to add retarder right away. In areas where we are, up where it's cold, it's damp, it's humid, usually we go a little more on thinner, usually 60% thinner, and obviously there's a very easy way to figure it out. Measure out a part of the can that you think would be a rough starting point. 10% of the mix is really a good place to start. So then you're at 60-40. But getting the mix all in one big can, getting it stirred, shaken up well, you have to remember, is a very high, highly pigmented material. It's going to sink to the bottom relatively quickly like all silver product does. So you want to get it shaken up, put in again, and sprayed for a test as soon as possible. My philosophy is I always like to have a couple little test parts. In this case, I have the rudder, the gear beers, the tip weight box. I want to have a little part. In the previous tape, we covered these parts, brought them up to where they have just a slight sheen and no imperfections. Now, what's going to happen when you put silver on for the first time? You really have to warn people ahead of time. Be prepared to be disappointed because the silver is going to show flaws in the corners and edges and things that you never would see with your naked eye. The silver technique has been around for many, many years. The first person I ever knew that used it was Jim Silhazy. And I don't know exactly how he did it, but I just, at some point in time in the mid-80s, I started using it myself. And it seemed like it's a thing that's caught on in the area around here. Most people that I know use the silver, find the floor, sand them out, until this part, or the main frame of the plane, is as perfect as you can make it. And that's a critical thing to remember. The silver serves two purposes. It fills in little floors, microscopic floors, but you really don't want to use it like primer. If you have giant floors, you want to use primer. Or if you're trying to fill grain, you want to use primer. But what you really want to do is use the silver to find your mistakes. And you'll see very soon when we paint this, this part and the main frame, you're probably going to be pretty disgusted. Now the silver also serves several purposes that we don't really have to concern ourselves with at this time. It does an excellent job, as it does in real airplanes, of blocking out UV. If you have a, an area of the country where you fly and leave the plane in the sun all day long, UV goes down into the finish underneath, and it can do damage as time goes by. You should never put a plane in the sun when it can be in the when it can be stored in the shade. Rule one. But the silver blocks out a lot of the UV, same way it does on a real Piper Cub Zapavia. Also allows you another choice you wouldn't otherwise have of finding the flaws. Now, if you were to wait until you painted the color paint on the plane. What happens is you would need twice as much of the color paint. Let's say you were going to do this blue as the Joanna Musco's original Spitfire. If there is no silver underneath this, he would need at least two to three times the amount of blue. So by painting over a silver surface that's perfect, you cut down on the amount of colored paint that you need. And it's the colored pigmented paint that makes a plane heavy. 
Typically, when a plane gets way too heavy in the finishing stage, it isn't because of the clear, it's because of the pigmented colors, the amount of... Let's just make an example up. If you're painting a plane white, and you're going over wood grain, you're probably going to need a lot of paint to do the covering. No matter what design you fly, whether it be a, a traditional design, a modern design, a pipe plane, or a 60, Saving weight in the colored part of the finish is a significant gain. Now the exception to this would be, and I want to mention this exception, if you were doing a finish similar to, this is David Fitzgerald's plane, and this is a beautiful work of art of an airplane, but notice what he's done, he's left the outer panels unpainted with just clear and dyed tissue. The reason for that, I'm assuming, is to keep some of the weight of the pigmented paint down. Well, there's a lot of ways to keep the weight of the pigmented paint down. This is one of them. I'm going to tell another one that I've had a lot of luck with. Now, I've had a lot of luck with another technique. I add pigment to the paint. Luckily, when John Brodak had the formulas made for this product, we increased the pigment amount in the paint, including the silver, so there's no need to what I call decant. And that is to let the material sink to the bottom and then pour it off the top. You really want to use Brodak silver with the formula that I just described. You don't need to decant it, it already has the extra pigment in it. Where you're going to find a significant gain is in the yellows and in the reds. Both of those colors took almost two months extra to get the formula right so that the coverage would be as good as possible without trading away any of the other good properties of the paint. But it's the silver that we have the biggest gain in. The silver is really, really a high coverage made specifically for this purpose. Cover very well and be easy to sand in a very short amount of time. Some of the techniques I've used, and this goes back to 1967-1966 when Harold Price was alive, I developed some of the techniques when we used a wet sand with soapy water, and now we wet sand with a product called Sickens M600. And using that method, over the years I've been able to do a lot of really nice finishing in a reasonable amount of time. And one of the things that makes it possible is the sanding of the silver. That's the part of it that a lot of people that don't use that method wind up putting extra white on a plane, the extra yellow, extra red. Colors that don't normally cover well, and the plane winds up heavier than they'd like it to be. So always think of the silver as your friend. And the silver, if you are going to paint, again, I'm going to re-emphasize this, if you want to paint an airplane white, right over the filler coat, you would need three times the amount of paint to get it white, as if you painted it once silver and once white. You actually will save about 30% by using that method. And I just want to mention one thing before we go any further on this. This was the first plane that I ever remember spraying silver on and sanding the silver. You see this plane has my own name on it. This is one of Harold Price's planes that I rebuilt in the winter of 1960. This is Harold's good plane in the back, the one he went to the match with. And I did this more of an exercise on how to learn how to refinish. And Harold Price, I want to thank him. He's, of course, passed away. I want to thank him again for the love and the attention that he gave me when I was a young man without a father. He was an inspiration. His craftsmanship, his workmanship, the inspiration he gave me has lasted a lifetime. And the knowledge that he imparted to me, I feel a tremendous obligation to pass on to other people. And I hope that this video and all the other videos that I've made, all 700 of them, are somehow going to filter down into the hobby and become Harold Price's permanent legacy. Now we're, of course, trying to make a Spitfire. Now, there are certain semi-scale things that like a dull finish. A real Spitfire would not have a shiny mirror finish. But we're not concerned with that right now. What we're trying to do is get a stump type of finish onto a Spitfire. And the last two planes that we've been able to do that to have wound up in the front row alone 
have wound up to be very popular with the, the flyers at large and have been very successful at winning appearance awards, both locally and at the Nats. Before I get outside, first I'm going to have to mask this off with aluminum foil using the real prey method. Because I don't want to, see, when I painted the clear on here, I didn't care if I got a little bit on the body, because I'm going to sand it down anyway when I do the fillets. But I don't want to get a lot of silver on there. It just would make extra work. So before I go on to painting this, the first thing I want to do is do the little test parts. Then I'm going to come back in the house. The reason for that is, while well, the test parts are dry, and I can see if they're going to fog up from humidity, and if I'm going to have to add retarder. I can do that little test. That'll give me roughly a half hour to back mask this off and then get outside and spray this. Now I always try to spray, if possible, with 25 pounds. 25 pounds on my gauge always gives me a nice thin finish that'll cover in one coat. And as I said, has been really shaped. Get some kind of a screwdriver to stir it up because if you use the top part of the paint and don't get all the pigment off the bottom, you will not get that real good coverage. Now you'll notice right away there's a very high pigment content in this material. So you want to be sure to do a good job of stirring it up. Every little tip you can get to make this more reliable. You're probably going to use two or three cans of this, but one can will get us one coat for sure, especially being the only pen in the ring. Again, you can tell right away when you've got all the pigment in suspension. You can see we've got all the pigment off the bottom. Now what I'm going to do is fill this can with thinner. That'll get me to the 50-50 level. And that'll also scoop out any of the extra material that's at the bottom of the can so none goes to waste. This is is Lodak thinner, and I get the last little bit out of the can. Now, when I'm all done with this, whatever material is left over, I'll mark what it is and put it right back in the original can, and it will help to have this can. I don't want to throw any of these cans away. Now, this will mean that I'm I'm going to want to add 10% more right away. But notice, notice 10% would just about fill a can. Wouldn't that be handy? I'm at 50-50. A good old-fashioned coffee can makes a great mixer. And that usually brings me to a good starting point. A lot of times, however, if the weather is really cold, I'll need to add a little more thinner. If it's humid, I'll add a little retarder. But that pretty much gets me started. If I get my compressor set for 25 PSI, in warm weather I can spray with 20. I've even had it down to 15. The warmer it gets, the less pressure you need to spray the material because the viscosity changes. Now just by looking at what drips off the screwdriver, I can usually tell if we're close. That's going to be real close. The can. But this is can one of the Spitfire. And then when I'm all done, whatever's left over, I can put right back in the original can. Make sure the lid is on tight and it'll be my good storage medium. I'll have a real good clue what's inside because I'm using the original label that was on the can. Really need things to sell for quart cans if you're going to use quart cans. But if you're not going to use a quart can, this is a great way to do it. And you'll keep your workshop a little neater than it normally would be. You don't want that to fall in the can. Well, we're all done. We just use a real coffee lid that doesn't have a hole in it. And save this one. We can clean it with thinner. It's a great little tip. This makes filling the gun a lot easier than if you try to pour it. And usually three quarters of it winds up on your <laughs> on your feet or something. Anyway, nice little trick. When you're all done, take this lid, wash it. And put a real lid on there if you're going to store it temporarily. When you're going to store it permanently, put it back into the original can. Now, I always try to use my oldest spray gun. Look at this. As I'm trying to look through the camera lens, it gets all over the place. Real world strikes again. Always the oldest spray gun that I have for the silver, since we're going to sand it anyway. 
had saved a good gun or a better gun for the color. In other words, the further and further up into the finish you get, you want to use a better and better gun. For spray and primer, for spray and the original coats, you don't look you don't need anything special, believe me. The hobby shop guns, this is a developer's gun, but you don't really need a hobby shop gun is plenty good. Okay, my little test piece. It looks to me like the mixture is fine. I'm, what I'm going to do is whenever I get a good mixture like this, because it's real cold outside, I want to cut back on the pressure. Maybe I can get it to run at 20 pounds today. I always want to use the minimum amount of pressure. That lets the paint lay down a lot nicer. Oh yeah, a couple of little test parts here, and while these are drying, I can get a real good feel for if I'm going to have to add retarder or not. And I'll do that while I'm masking off the body of the mainframe. Now even at 20 pounds, this is, this is just fine. So we've hit it right, right on the mark with the first one here. A piece, and then we'll get ready to, while these are drying, do up the mainframe. Alright, now we're gonna have to, obviously we're gonna spray out in the garage. We won't spray in the house anymore unless Karen is gone for the week or whatever. But you can see little places where it's dry on the rib caps, little spots where it needs right there and on the end leads a little refinish. This shows you all the little mistakes that you need to correct. And if you correct them now, when you go to put on that color finish, you need such a little bit of colored paint. God, it, it's it's staggering when it's over a good base of silver you can get away with using about a third the amount of colored paint. Now, again, the object of this is while this is drying, this has to dry and tell me that we don't have enough humidity in the air to make it milky white and cloudy. That gives me a roughly a half hour envelope, and in that half hour I can take and back mask the mainframe. Well, things will make this part of the job a lot easier for you. Make sure you have fresh tape. I have one of these, Joe Adamusco gave me this tape dispenser years ago. I like to use tin foil for this part of the job. One of the things you want to be sure. Now, if we, if we were going to paint the whole mainframe, like when you do a nobler or a profile, you, really, you don't need to do this step, but go over this real quick. I take the tape. Rub it up on my shirt once. That keeps it from being too sticky and pulling up pieces of finish that might already be on there. Leave about an eighth or a quarter of an inch of the tape sticking out. And now you can just go by little by little by little. It's really not a, a rocket science thing to, in fact, we don't even care if we get a nice line here. The fillet is gonna cover that up anyway. And in this case, I can just seal this back. I don't even have to bother making a curve. And if you really want it to be cool, you can take the template for the rib and just cut a hole in the silver, in the, uh, in the tin foil. In this case, we want to back mask everything, but we're not going to paint silver. And it's relatively simple. You can figure out. Just be doing it like a checkerboard, putting pieces wherever they need to go so that the only thing exposed is the wing. Okay, we're ready to spray. Now our parts show no sign of fogging up, so I won't, hopefully not, not going to have to add any retarder. I can go, just go with a straight 60-40 mix here. It's always good to have that dry before you go on to the mainframe, because once you do the mainframe, oh, geez. Always good to have little test parts. It's relatively cold and damp in here, and I don't know how good the footage is going to come out, the spray footage, but we're going to give it a shot. It's, 
it's definitely too cold to paint outside in the open air with the wind blowing. So even if you can get protected from uh, a little bit into, into a garage or a confined area, it's a big help. And we always try to make do with conditions that we, we have to live with. We really don't have a choice about a lot of things. One thing for sure, the sun has been sitting for a while, so hold your finger over the a little overflow hole, shake it up good. Number two, another good thing, we're always trying to get extra on the edges. Notice I'm painting the bottom first. That's always a good choice in case something isn't exactly the way you want it. And I'll let this dry and give it a half an hour so it'll be dry. Then flip it over and do the top half. I'm still waiting to, be, to confirm that I don't have a humidity problem. And that's always, I'm trying to use 25, I'm down to about 20 here. Even in this cold weather, this material just sprays so nice. Again, you could use a finishing friend. Byron Walker makes a really nice finishing friend. In fact, I have one here. I just haven't had time to set up a little plate for the nose. Before this project's over, I think we're going to be doing that. But I'm so used to uh, just working under a certain type of condition. Oh yeah, the floors come right to the top. You can see every little rib cap that isn't right. I'm trying to get a little extra right on the edge of the seat stand. Now, if I wasn't shooting video, I'd have my Wilson mask on. Believe me, I've tried, and it's the funniest thing. I'm trying to shoot video, and all you hear is that very edge of the seat stand. You really can't do it. It is, it is about as easy a material to use, and I have used every kind of epoxy and Imran, and I have spent my whole life trying to find a nice finishing material, and this is it. Now, part of the reason it's good is because, number one, it's a mil-spec product, so it's consistent from batch to batch. Number two, what's going to happen here is this is going to pop up on me. The wind is, I can feel the wind at my back. And I'm going to be buying, I think, real soon, one of these flexible hoses that goes just before here. Because I can see that, and when I used to paint in the cellar, it wasn't a problem, but I could see it could get to be a problem out here. Let me use the lowest pressure you possibly can to get a nice flow out. Extra pressure just gives you orange peel, and orange peel has to be sanded. And you really, you can see with all the extra pigment that's in here, this just covers like and it's really bulletproof stuff. Now I really wish I could have drawn back some of the other planes I built and using this material I could have made them an ounce or two lighter. I could have made them half the time. And this is, I'm going to show this on camera. There's a dry spot right here. So while it's upside down, I can hit that with a little extra material. I know along the trailing edge, it's not as smooth as I'd like it to be. So I can just put an extra coat here. This will help me in sanding it out. I can go right along the leading edge. And that's where this is the worst. This is going to need the most attention up on the leading edge. When I get to sanding that leading edge, I'll probably do that four or five or six times before I'm happy with it. It's that leading edge. The sheeting in by the body because we're going to do a fillet. Whoa, there goes the wind. I'll tell you, the wind is crazy here. Anyway, 
what I think I'm going to do is just let one panel dry up here and just confirm that I don't have a humidity problem. Or it's dry as you're going along, don't hit it, hit it. You see a little spot here, there's a little floor you can see. Just hit it with a little extra material. Out here, you can see a little floor out there. Anyway, that one panel dry. Again, maybe I'll shut the doors, go and have a cup of coffee, come out and finish this. I'm really in no rush. I have the whole day to do this. I just want to get the silver on, and then the trick is, let it, of course, let it dry the minimum of overnight. nice until you spray the silver. It's unbelievable. I see two or three spots here. Really, I can't believe I didn't find them with my bare hands. A couple of spots up by the lead-out guide. I'm making little mental notes. These little tippets are a pain. Again, you have that choice at this point in time to put as much or as little time as you want into this step. But the silver is always going to show you stuff that you thought, ah, oh, why didn't I, ah, oh, gee. Be prepared for a little disappointment. It's, it's going to happen. remember years ago spraying a coat of silver even in the summer and you couldn't sand it for three or four days that you turn to chewing gum. A little testing that I've done with the silver. Even though they were primed and radiused and sanded, there's still little, little spots where they could be a little nicer. Yeah, that's the advantage of doing the bottom first. Now, if I saw something blushing out here, I could just add a little retarder to this. But I remember when I used to be able to paint in the house, one of the tricks was I'd get up in the morning, Turn the heat way up in the house and then shut the furnace off so it didn't spread the, the spray. You look at some of those old videos where I was able to paint the house to get it. So we do have a master plan. This time next year I want to have the shop a little bit more set up as maybe even a spray booth or yeah, it's that leading edge. Boy, there's one floor on that leading edge. It looks like somebody hit it with a hammer. And then down the edges. That's where it's going to be a little extra help. some of the little reflections of, uh, of the silver. They really do show every floor. Okay, now that's going to dry overnight. And I hope in, uh, you know, tomorrow we're going to be able to sand it out. But of course, we always have our little test pieces to confirm how things are drying. Amazing how many floors you see. Wow. It looks so good until I painted it silver, but everybody feels that way. Okay, back to this project tomorrow. Okay, now there's a couple of tricks right off the bat that'll make sanding out the first coat of silver a lot easier. The number one thing is let it dry. No matter what material you have, any lacquer-based material, it gets harder and harder with age. So in this case, we've kind of cheated the system a little bit we were running our jet program and we were doing a lot of other things in the meantime. We put this aside to dry, I think three or four days already. But it doesn't really matter. 
We have sanded it out within one day. I would say the minimum time you want to do a sand out of silver is 24 hours. But even better, if you can let it sit, especially if you can let it sit by a heating vent, oh gee, a week, two weeks, it'll just make it a lot easier. Now, there's a lot of different methods that work. Soapy water will work fine. Problem with soapy water, it doesn't evaporate and it tends to make everything a big sponge by the end of the day. People have used Prepsol. Prepsol evaporates a lot slower than M600. M600 is kind of like a little bit faster drying. Now what I try to do is always do a little test on the bottom, and what, in which case I'll try both methods to see. In this case, you could use 600 or 1200, either one, but you don't want to use anything rougher than 600 to do a silver sand out. This is a body shop product, if you're not familiar with it, it's called Sickens M600. Now I'm trying to, let's, let's look right up here. It's a good idea, first of all, to read all the, the hazardous warnings. You don't want to work with this without a little bit of a ventilation fan going. In our case, we leave the back door open. You might want to even wear a mask. Best of all, if we were in a warm weather climate, we could do this outside. Second of all, it is flammable, so you don't want to obviously have your friend smoking a cigar right next to you. Now, I want to get some of these numbers because a lot of people can't buy this at their local body shop, and you might want to have a gallon shipped over to you. These are all the numbers that they give on the can. Again, the first thing to do is check your local body shop supply. If you can't get this, another choice, many people use Windex, many people use windshield washer fluid, soapy water will work, just plain water will work, but I think of all the things that, that will make this job easier, this is the best product of all, and it's taken many years for me to figure this one out. This is my own invention. I don't lay claim to a whole lot of this stuff, but M600 is one of the things I came across in my world of body shop painting of motorcycles and boats and guitars. This was the sand out material of choice. Now one of the things you'll find, you can take a Windex bottle. The thing that you can't do with M600, you can't put it in a little bowl or a cup because what happens, it evaporates so quickly, you'll just be letting letting it gas off. It just goes too quickly. So the best way to use it is with a sprayer. What'll happen, a Windex sprayer is good, dump out the Windex, it'll last a couple of days, but the seal will eventually go and it won't work. You can buy these bottles for about two hours from Consolidated. Let's see if they have their phone number on here. I just ordered stuff from them the other day. Here's their number. Get their catalog. Their catalog has a lot of good, all kind of little things that you might want to have around the shop. Give them a call. Pick up one of these inexpensive bottles. Now this bottle's three years old. Kenny was using it, I was using it, George was using it. It's still good. And it still sprays real nice and it has an adjustable tip so you can control the spray. So for a couple of dollars, you've got the right bottle. And you want to get both 600 and 1200 paper for seeing which is going to work the best on your particular application. And what this is, now this is step three in the Brodac finishing regime, regimen, whatever you want to call it. But this is kind of a step that's going to make or break the airplane. At this point in time, if you're real fussy and willing to go back two or three times and sand out the silver and fix the floors, you've got a guarantee front row plane. If you're not willing to do it, at this point in time, if you skip off and you run off to do something else when you should be sanding out another coat of silver or two, the finish will be nice. This Sanding this out will make it better no matter what you do, but sanding it out more than once or twice will make it perfect. And this is the step that seems to win the concourse or whatever year, in my estimation. This is what separates the planes in the front couple of rows. Now, I pr always prefer, if all else is equal, to use 1,200 paper. 1,200 paper gives you a lot of advantage. First of all, it's going to take longer to sand out. But the advantage is, for that little extra time you spend, is a lot less chance that you're going to go through, make a hole, make a divot that you can't fix. 
gives you, it, it just removes material in a lot slower fashion and leaves an, a finish that's almost ready to buff out when you're done. So what I like to do, if at all possible, since you're going to be going down to your local body shop supply house anyway to get M600, pick up a whole sleeve. By buying a sleeve of it, it's about half the price and if you buy individual sheets. Down here in the, where we are here, it's about $35 for a sleeve of this, but well worth it. When you consider the overall cost of building a plane and all the time and energy that goes into it, the sandpaper is the least <laughs> of consideration of anything. But don't skimp on sandpaper. Don't try to use it when it's all worn out. Sandpaper is something that you use just like you use tires on a car. When they're worn out, you get rid of them before they go flat. Remember, there's a lot of ways of getting that high gloss finish. There, there isn't just one way, and if you deviate from this a little bit, it's not going to come out right. But this is a map. This is kind of like a straight line map to get from point A to point B. You can take a look at the workmanship here, the, the craftsmanship, whatever you want to call it. There's always little spots like this. Now, each time you sand the silver, they'll be less and less objectionable. You can see the little hairs in the tissue. Let me see if I can get really down here. And that's just about how it should be. And so I want to get ready. What I do is I try to get some ventilation going, get comfortable, have a cup of coffee, because this is a long and tedious job to do this. You're not going to be able to do this in 15 minutes and be done. This is pretty much, in my case, an all-night job, or I call it an all-football game job. Get, get something that's not going to be boring, put some music on or whatever, because you've got about three or four hours to sand this out, maybe longer if you're going slow. But I won't even uncover the foil because obviously we're going to put another coat of silver on here when we're done. Even if this coat is, an, is a perfect coat, I'd want to sand it off and then put on that paper thin coat. Just very, very, maybe I'll add another third of thinner to the material so that that silver is as thin as possible. This little trick, I keep an old pair of scissors. I get Probably, realistically, I'm going to use four or five sheets for the sand out. So what I do, I cut them into little bite-sized pieces. I can't sand, especially wet sand, with a big giant piece of paper. And whatever size you're comfortable with, and by the way, you don't need a pair of good scissors. You should always have a pair. I say this, but I don't do it. You should always have, don't smoke cigarettes, and here I am smoking. Keep an old pair of scissors around for doing stuff like this. Now you have, you're all prepped up. And the more preparation you can put into this, it makes that long and tedious job of sanding just go quicker. I have like a little deck of playing cards. I filled up the M600, and I'm ready to start sanding this out. First thing I like to do is I like to, when you're going to do this kind of stuff, you've got to be relatively comfortable because you're going to be in this position for, for quite a while. I like to pick a spot. The object of this is to try to do the bottom of the outboard panel because if we go through, who cares if we put some extra weight here, if we have to put 10 extra coats of silver? Because you're always going to develop a little bit of a technique first. It, even when I don't do this for a month or so, it takes me a little bit of time just to get a technique going to know how hard I need to press. Each plane seems to be a little bit different. Now I've sanded Brodak silver out in the past and it sands like butter. So I know ahead of time I'm not going to even try 600 paper. 600 paper might be appropriate if you really have a rough structure you're trying to really fill in in a hurry. Or if you were trying to sand two coats of silver at once. Now I know a lot of people think, ah, oh, I know how to beat this system. I'll just spray three coats of silver and then sand it. Now, sand each coat. You'll just build up extra weight. That is 120 bays on this plane. And I know, for instance, if I'm going to spend three to five minutes per bay, I'm probably looking at seven, eight hours of work here. But in the overall time of doing a plane like this, especially something as complex as a Spitfire, eight extra hours doesn't mean anything. Now, here's the first test. By looking at the paper, no chewing gum at all. You know if if you were trying to do this 20 minutes after you painted, you might get chewing gum. Now what it is, let's just show this up close. 
any spot you see now that's shiny, now see the spot that's shiny right here, you know that's a low spot, and that's going to get filled in each time you put a coat of silver on. Right here, you know, you're always going to get the middle of the base sanded smooth, but you don't want to get it any deeper than this. Once you've removed almost all the silver, and again, if you want to really be fancy, you can sand some more and try to make this as silver-free as possible, but you always get a little bit up around the ribs, and that's what gives it that extra little smoothness around the ribs that it looks like it's machined out of a billet of aluminum when you're finished. Things when you first start. First off, if you have soft, kind of nice, neat hands, you might want to consider trying using rubber gloves. I don't because my hands are shot from doing all kind of construction work and roofing and hammering things and everything seems to be pretty crude in the rest of my life beside modeling. But I like to use, now you see what I'm doing? I'm using a different piece of this, different edge of the sandpaper for each bay. You want to keep the material wet. Once this dries out, you're not going to make a lot of progress. You see how it's, I'm, I'm like in a puddle of this material. And it's, it's the fact that it evaporates so quickly that makes it very practical. Now, as soon as it becomes where it's like paste and it's not liquidy, get rid of it. Get rid of it right away. Now, see, we're about halfway done. I've used the other piece of the sandpaper. Now I'm using the other edge. I'll start with a new edge. So I'm constantly rotating the paper. Now I see a couple of really chunky monkey spots coming up on this edge. And this again just depends on how fussy do you want to be. Do you want to be where you're, you're making a run for that concourse award? Do you just want to have it that it's nice enough to be better than one of your friend's models? Do you want to make it that it's one of the best planes of all time ever? I mean, you know, in each case, the decision is always if you're willing to spend the time. By the way, it's nice now, a side benefit to having that Brodak primer on the rib caps is they really show up. As soon as I see that white coming through, I know I don't want to go a whole lot deeper than that. And I can get in all the edges and corners. Now, in 1984, I made a geodetic wing plane similar to the ones that Bob Hunt makes. And the one thing I found was a little bit time consuming was getting in the corners where the ribs are. In a plane like an I-beamer, it's difficult to get in the corners. And again, when you go back to any I-beam plane I've ever made, I always remember getting in the corners was a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of extra work. But this is the kind of thing that it's a very personal thing, how much time you want to spend sanding the silver. And even if you just want to do it for practice, let's say you're building a Banshee, a Prowler, a Brodak Cardinal, and you just want to see, hey, let me see if I can upgrade the finish. Well, this is definitely going to work for you. This is definitely one of the, one of the steps to learn. Step three, sanding the silver. Again, I get to about this point and I don't want to push this any further. See, I don't want to get... I'm just trying to show one or two bays here how much time I would be willing to spend. And I don't want to get on top of the ribs to where I'm getting little hairs of silk span coming through. Now that looks like about as far as I'd want to push this. And I don't know, I'd have to look at my watch there. I'd say, I'd say that's three to five minutes. When I'm done, three to five minutes a bay is about right. And it really doesn't matter because on a D-tube wing, you'd have less bays. A bay is going to take the same amount of time. But on, a, on this plane, being we have so many rib bays, it's just going to take extra time. Anyway, at this point, now you can feel that. And boy, all the places you see an imperfection, you don't feel them anymore. You see them, but you don't feel them. And this should feel almost like, I don't know, a buffed out piece of plastic, fiberglass, something really smooth at that point in time. And now you can interpolate on the plane you're building just how long that's going to take and how many coats you're willing to put on that. So with that in mind, I'll start on the bottom of the wing. Always work the bottom of the model first. Get one wing done. This way if I do go too far or I screw up or something bad happens, I'd like it to be on the bottom of the model. By the time I flip this over this afternoon or tonight, I'd like to be really in, you know, have this under control and be in, have my reflexes and my, the amount of pressing I want to put on this and everything just about the way I want it. And it's just time and effort.
tips. As I'm going to sand out, I'm trying to think of all the tips that would be appropriate that'll save you some time and energy. You know, one of the things will save you a lot of time, again, always keep the thing soaking wet. But in doing so, and this I wanted to make sure I mentioned this, see when I'm floating this on, some of this is working its way down around the bottom of the wing. So as you do each bay, you really would like to, when you blot the bay out, and what happens as you go further and further along, you'll get faster and faster and better and better. It'll, it'll never be slower than in the very beginning unless your arm gets tired. And hey, look at it this way. Even if your arm gets tired, you need the exercise anyway. You want to look like, uh, you know, some football player or something. Or some guy that was rowing a slave ship with nice big arms. This will definitely help you do it. No doubt about that. Anyway, when you go to clean this bay out, and I know this is one of the problems people have written me about and said, oh, gee, oh, I have this problem, you know. You got to keep it floating. Keep that so it's definitely good and liquidy if you want to make good progress with 1,200 paper. But the, but the biggest thing is now when I get to the end of this sand out on this bay, I don't want to leave the material that's dripped around the wing on the other side of the wing. That's a that's a real problem. And I remember several people, you know, that were working in a shop. They'd be especially if you're working outside in the sun. It seems like that cakes up and makes for a real problem. Anyway, let me just get. Yeah, we're almost finished now. But when I do this wipe, a lot of people, if you do this, see they haven't wiped the other side of the wing. And notice I'm working on a padded table with an old sheet. At the end of this, I'll take that sheet and throw it in the washing machine. Keep the back clean too. And you'll notice after about five bays, just throw the towel away. Actually, when you start out doing this, you think, oh my God, I'm never gonna get done. But then when it's over, you're looking and say, that wasn't so bad. Especially the first time you put on the next coat of silver now will look even nicer. The coat after, and the next coat we can thin it out even more. That's the part that makes this nice is you can thin it out and, and that final coat will just be like glass on that. It really will be nice. Now it's of no value if you sand right through and take off all the silver less value. You, I want to try to show that using 1200 you almost get a shine. See the part that we haven't sanded yet is less shiny. We're really building up a nice finish here, especially on an eye beamer. But if you leave it all on, or if you take too much off, you've defeated the purpose of the silver. This is just about the right amount. When you can see the middle of the bay is just so showing the little flaws that may be there and just a little bit around the edge of the caps because that's where you want to have some extra material and everything else pretty much sanded off. Now just as an example, this bay here I could sand a little more off as I get fussier and fussier. Right out here I could take a little more off, even though this is the outboard tip. The weight isn't really a factor out here. But I'm just trying to build my technique as I work my way down the wing. It, it just takes a little time to get that feel for how much am I going to take off. You don't want to take too much off either. It's it's the best when it's, I would say this bay right here is about as close, maybe a little more out here. But look at each individual bay as an individual section. Hey, if you want to do this kind of work, this is the way you can really upgrade your skills. And it really isn't difficult. It, it takes a little time to build a skill and the rest is just patience and hard work. Now we have to do about a half a panel. I just want to look around, just using, give an, give an idea of how much sandpaper I'm using. I well, get about plenty of that. We're not using a lot of that. Time for a new towel, of course. But just get an idea of just how much material this much of it took me roughly an hour to do, just roughly. Okay, it's a good time to take a break. <laughs> it takes longer than you think to do this. Anyway, I always like to take a break after I get one panel done. I like to be real careful. This is where normally where you tend to go through, right at edges. So I always like to leave a little silver there. I'll take a little break, have a cup of coffee, come back and work on that outer wing. This is where you see who's tough and who isn't.
Power, you can actually see a little bit of the light reflecting off it. You can actually candle it. And of course, candling helps you find a little mistakes. And just as an example, when you see a spot like this, you know that would show in the final finish. But another couple of coats of silver and that'll be gone. A little rough spot like right there, a couple little spots like this, they'll all disappear within another coat or two of silver. Little spots if you were to have a, there's another one back here. You don't see that when the plane is in clear. It kind of gets hidden from you. Then you're all done, you get the color paint on and you, ah, oh, now you can't fix it. Another little spot there that's rough. Anyway, just evaluate, you know, on your own, of course. You can see, you actually can see light reflecting off of that wing now. Even though we've just sanded this coat of silver and using it as primer, you can see the tinfoil reflecting off the wing. Okay, we had ourselves a nice break, nice couple of minutes of relaxation, a cup of coffee, and now we're ready to tackle a second, second of the bottom panels. You might have thought that slavery was outlawed. Jack Bryan comes all the way from where? Lincoln, Nebraska? Knocks at the front door and says, Hi, want some company? Guess what I got him doing all afternoon? <laughs> Look at this for a lousy $4 slice of pizza. He sanded out the whole wing. So now when we go to the Nats, I guess you get one of the 20 points or 8 points or something. I don't know. Anyway, Jack, you have anything you want to say to John Brodak? I'm you better finish that cardinal kit, Jack Bryan. <laughs> he's got a cardinal kit. By the way, he's the one that's got the red Nobler on the video Nobler, the Ken video Nobler. And it's a beauty. That is really a work of art. But keep sanding. Don't think just because you're a movie star you can stop sanding now. All right. You don't think you don't think slavery is outlawed in the state of Jersey here, do you? Keep working. I'll tell you when it's shiny enough. Just having a little fun, that's for sure. I always laugh about how nobody ever comes over to see you the day you have to sand your silver out. Yeah. I wanted to show there was a run on here. Where the hell did it go? See? Now I can't even find it. Here. There was a run in the clear, a little run. Mm -hmm. And put your finger over that now. You can't even feel that. See, that's... Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see how nice that Brodak primer? The rib tops really already have a finish on them. So that worked out pretty good. How much does he pay you anyway? <laughs> Not much. Then the only sandwich a day. Anyway, this is this is how much we got. What do we take about an hour a panel? So I'm guessing an hour and a half for the first panel, an hour for the second panel. By midnight tonight, I'll have this done. It'll probably be, it's, it's going to be dark already by the time I do the top. But I always like to do the bottom first, the top second. That's always uh, a good philosophy. Now I'm in a mood. I'm ready to rock and roll that whole top part of the plane in a couple hours. Now the bottom is completely done. Jack is already so tired, he says, <laughs> Sorry I ever came up to see you. Anyway, notice when you're sanding silver how many of your friends have a have to go to the bathroom, they don't show up, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's the way it goes. Anyway, we're going to start doing the top and just see if we can finish this up tonight. Look at this, Jack Bryan. <laughs> Jack Bryan's here. Cameron brings down cookies, coffee, amaretto flavor. When I'm here alone working, you know what I get, Jack? <laughs> get it yourself. <laughs> True story. Now on the top surface, just just a couple of things that have come out is I've got this bay right here, and I'm going to try to focus in on this. This one, I can feel a rib coming through, and it's sharp. So what I want to do is, I took some rejuvenator and a striping brush, and I've been putting a stripe of rejuvenator on there, not clear now, rejuvenator, maybe every 10 minutes, letting it dry out, so as it's dry to touch another one, so I can build this area up just a little bit. Now, we're going to see how that works as a repair, and obviously later on I can just touch that little spot up. Closing in on the last little piece here. The last panel. Jack is already dead. He's laying over there trying to put things in his pocket with nobody's left. 
Oh God, anyway, so we're fighting our way. One more panel and we'll be out in the garage, I hope. It'll be nice and cold out there tonight too. Rejuvenator. It's always good if you have a, even a little jar of this around the house. This is for making your patches. And this works wonders when you sand through a rib. It's like magic. We'll find out if it's like magic in one minute. Much better to use this than to use clear, although clear would be the second choice. And now every five minutes or so, just put another coat on. I think this is the second coat. But we'll try to get four or five of them on there while I'm sanding out the other panel. And also, I'm looking around. You can see right here, I've, got, I've gotten another spot real thin. Well, whenever you do have something like that, why wait? You know you're going to sand through that on the next coat. Why fool around? Another spot where you see you've gone through a little drop of rejuvenator. The rejuvenator has extra plasticizer in it, so it tends not to be brittle either. See any other spots, Jack? You see me. Uh -huh. That should do it. Temperatures, it's not below freezing, but it's cold. About, I would say it's about 45, 48 degrees. All right, I always prefer to check it. If I'm going to spray out in the garage like this, I like to get, uh, hopefully, as warm as possible. But since it's dark and it took us all day to do this, <laughs> anyway, we have no choice. Now, always do the bottom first. So if you have a problem, you need to adjust something. I've said that before. Always do that. Use the, bo the bottom as the guinea pig. Look at the compressor. I try to get about 25, 20. This temperature is cold. Try to get a little light to the edge. And you're going to be doing it soon enough, Rich. You may as well get in the water and get wet. Because you don't stand in front of the camera. They ain't got that much water to go up. I really, I, today I worked on the flaps, and I started cutting my uh, inches, the flaps, the inches, and then I stopped. Just put one finger here, just one finger, to hold it up. See, what I try to do is when I make the second pass, is get a little bit extra on the rib. Right. Now we had a couple of soft spots on this where the ribs needed a little extra paint. I put rejuvenator on them. Jack is down there hammering away with me. I couldn't get him to sand the whole plane out there. He's too smart for that. <laughs> now, what do you sand with? 600? This is all 1200. 1200. You even got a little bit of a shine on this when you get on it. see that. Now, I'll see hey, if this looks like it needs another coat, or if I'm going to be happy with it. You know, you could do this three, four times, you do it once. But each time you do it, it gets nicer than the time before. See what I'm doing? I'm spraying the bay right. and then going over the rib cap. Spray right. the bay so to keep the, where the rib is, there's actually an extra coat on it. Now, how many coats did you roll uh, from? This is the second coat of solar. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now, I just look around and see. I always get a little bit extra on the edges, a little bit extra on the rib caps. You'll see the spots where it's soft. It's soft right there. Right there. It's got a, it took a little bit too much off. But each time you do it, it'll be nicer than the time before. You don't have to, you don't have to even think about it. Just hold that. Yeah. Just keep that from moving. It, that, you know, yeah, even is good. That's good. But the trick to the whole thing is to get twice as much on the ribs as on the silk man if you can. And if you really want to be crazy, you can take a an airbrush and airbrush over the ribs. I've done that already. That even makes it nicer. But for all purposes here. The sand, I'm glad I came over tonight. Yeah, this is good. Well, you're going to do your plane. I mean, this is the way you're going to... I mean, I assume you're going to do it over here. Yeah, I'd like to. Put the bottom first. 
put the silver on, go home, sand it out, come back to it. You know, you can do this ten times. It doesn't get heavier because each time you sand in more and more material off. Jack, there's that spot we had. See how it yeah. kind of fudges up? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I do is, well, before we flip this over, I'll just hit that with a little extra paint. Any little spot. Now, as you see, you'll see there's a little spot right there. Okay, right there's another one. Those are the spots where you sand just you know, a little bit, and in fact, there's one here. You try to look for them as it's, you know, as you're drying. Even up here, you see that little spot? That's why you're not getting all this extra paint on a whole plate. You only put the paint in the region to make it wet. So, I just keep giving a little pressure. You see the little Oh, yeah. Yeah, you lose all the strength. Well, that's the thing. It looks like you're punching it a little bit. I didn't realize you were going to be here when I was doing this, but it just worked out well with the place. Now, your wing should be ready for silver in a week or so, right? Yeah, just about. Okay. So, if I can figure it out. Yeah. Well, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Rich, make a copy of that tape one so that you can see how uh, the tissue and stuff was done. And uh, tomorrow I'll have some more clear Brodac soap. I don't have to get tape one. No, I gotta give you a copy. Oh, you do? Okay. I was so this way it'll save you a lot of aggravation. I don't know how, if I can duplicate your tape. You don't need me all your machine? My machine, yeah. Well, if you can, just make a copy. Yeah, here's a spot. I can see the spots here once it's wet. Right there, right there. As soon as it's wet, you can see the spots come right up right there. That's the beauty of silver. That's why you use the silver. It's even on a trail. I thought you were just putting a little silver in the all, 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 all. Instead, it's just plain silver that you use. It's just this is silver, Brodac silver, right out of the can. This has a little more than 50-50 thinner in it. That's a nice gun. Okay. Yeah, yeah, hang on to that. Nice. Now we'll just let this dry for a little while. Yeah, nice. We'll let this side dry and then come back and do the other side. Last thing tonight is I want to do the same thing on these parts, sand everything down, get another coat of silver drying up so I have the little hatches in the rudder. And then we'll put that aside to dry for a couple of days. <clears throat> I want to do a little test right now. This is for my own self. This is not really an appropriate thing to, uh, well, Maybe it is appropriate. It is appropriate. I don't know. What I wanted to do is I painted these parts late last night. I sprayed on a coat of silver when I was painting the mainframe. And as I always do, I want to do a little test. Now, this dope is really only maybe nine, maybe ten hours old. And I want to see just... So I'm trying to get a gauge on just how long it needs to dry. Of course, it'll be easier to sand if it's dry longer. But I want to see what that minimum time... What I'm looking for is to figure out that minimum time before it'll take a nice, reasonable sand out. So it's always good. That's why it's always good to have some little parts to do your testing on. Now, I always like to do a quick test. Again, this is what the throw parts for, because now we're building up a relatively smooth finish. The way you always tell if dope is ready to sand and this is legitimately nine hours old. Now, I really, I shouldn't even be doing this. But one of the things you can see is it's coming right off, and it's not turning to chewing gum. So I'm wondering, now I would ask the people down at Randolph, since they're right down at my, down the street from my house, I would ask them, what is the minimum time to sanding? The problem is they may not really know, like using our application, but I know for sure, one thing I can tell you for sure, this is ready to sand, so I'm going to get busy and possibly get this sanded out or parts of it today. I don't really have a whole day, but just another part of my testing is whenever paint is soft, it's always good, and you, or you anticipate it soft, using just slightly grittier paper. That prevents it, but in this case, we don't even have to prevent it. So it looks like certainly eight, nine hours is more than enough. I wanted to see how this was going to sand out with 600 now. 
can pretty well figure out. That's, that's sanding right out. Nine hours, ready for the sand out. This is where the real time saving comes from using this material is not waiting all those hours and days and weeks for things to dry out and gas off. And this, uh, this I think, is one of the nicest features of Brodac Dope. I just try this. 600 paper again. One of the things I wanted to try was, and this is for my own information, really. Even though I prefer 1200, I want to see just how this is going to cut over silk span. And on these little parts, I'd, obviously I'd like to always use little parts before I go ahead and work on the mainframe. I like to keep the mainframe for non-experimental parts of this. And one of the other options you have if you like using 4-0 steel wool, I use it from time to time, but it's not my first choice. But several people have been real successful with it. Give that a try also. It looks like this material is going to sand out beautifully, even with 600. But it won't really make a big difference, since we're going to paint right over this anyway. I want to go run and throw a little silver back on this. See, each coat I'm sanding less and less off because I've got all the high spots picked out now. Now, what you can see is each time you put a coat of silver on, it's going to get a little nicer than the time before. You can see, let's see if we can find some little right here. Something we might want to sand out in the next coat. I think you can, now see this is a dry spot. This is where you don't have enough dope right up on the rib. What I'd like to do another little tip is at all costs, try not to put any retarder in the silver because what happens is you'll open up seams. And what will happen is any little spot where you've got a sanding scratch, it just makes it worse with the retarder. So, but one of the golden rules is if you're spraying silver and it's not coming out the way you want, if it fogs up, really a good time to wait for another day to do it. But right now I want to try to sand this out. Now one of the things I'm really careful of is as I go by in each case, in each coat, I try to sand just a little less. Now I tried to see if I could work on my open bay areas with 600 and it was just getting a little bit risky. Risky being that you start to go through in spots. So I'm back to my 1200 routine. So what I'm trying to do now, because I'm gonna hope to get this done in maybe one or two more coats. And we'll say maybe one or two, who knows. The more careful you are at each step, just like a foundation of a house, the straighter you make everything at the bottom of the house, the straighter everything at the top will be. So the more of this I can clean up, and I can't emphasize enough, when you mix, do your silver mix, try not to use any retarder, just wait another day. That's always a problem. Now another trick, as I'm working, I see a little spot that I might be getting real close on a sand through. I can look at it with a little magnifier, and I see, yes, that is going to be a problem. When I get to a spot like that, what I do, I'll try to just very gently sand over it and then take and brush a little coat of rejuvenator with a striping brush over that. I've already done one or few ahead of time. Where I thought I saw a little spot coming through. That's one, another good use for that Brodac rejuvenator. Just one, see, as I'm sanding out, I'm going very carefully trying to find the spots, the high spots where they come up. It is always going to be, no matter what you do, and I don't care how careful, there's always going to be little spots you need to touch up and fudge up. But we're not going to get to work on this too much today. I'm just filling in some spare time here, and I'll probably finish this tomorrow when I get some real time, a nice solid block of time to work on it. I just wanted to get it started, and I really wanted to see just how long it would take before this, before this dope was sandable. And I think nine hours is, well, it's sanding. 1,200 and 600. And I'll finish it up tomorrow. Now it's raining all day today, and obviously we're not going to spray. But even if we if we had this sanded out, this is the kind of day you just wait for another day, especially when doing silver. So I'm going to try to get down there and 
See if I can get that sanding at least finished today. Now I just wanted to make a point before I get down to sanding that I didn't finish this in the first session. It's not a big deal. I just stop at a bay where, I, where I'm comfortable. And, and, and again, this is the kind of stuff it just takes time. A rainy day like this, I'm going to make myself up a big double cup of coffee, get the padded chair out. I know this is going to take three or four hours. This is a good day to try to do this. And we're not going to even try to spray this until we get a nice dry day. Cold is okay, but humid isn't. Even though I tried, yeah, I'll try. I really wanted to push this and get an idea of just how quickly you could sand the silver. It's always a good idea to wait a couple of days, and we did let this sit an extra day, and I wanted to mention that because you can see how quickly each coat of silver will sand out just a little quicker than the time before. And you can always buy some sanding time on a bay if you just let it dry an extra day or two, especially up by a heating vent now. Even after a day or two, it will sand a little quicker. Even though we tried that, we were trying to push this and see just how quickly you could sand it out. Again, each coat gets sanded just a little bit easier. Leave a little more on until we have that final. We're just trying to hit, get the mountain tops off without going through. I don't want to see any raw wood, if possible. I have gone through in a couple little spots that have just been a little heavy-handed. I try to examine each bay when I'm done with it. Again, it helps if you're not under any pressure to get this done. One of the best tricks I know of is start real early in the morning, have your coffee, and because this is kind of a sit-down, even though it's laborious, it's not heavy work. And when you see a rainy day like that, I know there's no chance at all I can do any outdoor construction work or anything, so I'm kind of locked in for the day here doing my sanding. And actually, it is kind of nice and relaxing, up to a point. But if you have some idea about each coat sand, that same thing, just sand just a little bit less. We're trying to build this up until the whole wing looks like it's machined out of one billet of aluminum, if possible. You, you can be as careful as you want, but especially when you're doing an I-beam wing, you're always going to get little spots where you've gone through. Into the substrate, into the white, into the primer. And, and what I've found is rather than doing this with, I used to do this with dope, Rejuvenator is a lot better. And I just hit the spots where I've gone through. Because now I'm not adding weight to the whole structure, I'm just adding it to this one little spot. And the Rejuvenator has a very high penetrating formula. It goes right in and softens everything right up. And even if you were to have to go over every rib, say you were building a Brodak Nobler and you needed to go back over every rib, it really wouldn't even matter. You're not adding any weight. And this dries relatively flat. Just one of the millions of little details you can put into. The Rejuvenator is, is the product to use right here. Not clear, Rejuvenator. Another side benefit, Rejuvenator has an awful lot of plasticizer. Now, a lot of people might not be used to even using any Rejuvenator, they don't even know what it is, but it's a product that's made to fix hail damage in real aircraft, very high penetrating, self-leveling, put it on with about a 50-50 thinner mix, just go over any spot that you see that you're getting real close on. This is really a good tip. This is the kind of stuff years ago nobody would tell you. Everything was such a big secret. Well, it's always a good feeling to get halfway through one of these panels. The only problem is I gotta finish the top. 
And as I'm going around, I see all these little spots. Once they dry, once the rejuvenator dries, and I've been putting like two or three coats right over that. That really, really just puts the final little touch on it. All right, time to flip this over and do the top now. The only problem with all of this stuff is just when you think you're done, <laughs> it comes out on the other side. Anyway, I'm going to try like heck to finish this in this session. And this is one of the another little trick. You don't want to let this stuff stay on a ring now because I've been working on it. It'll, if you leave too much of it, it'll tend to dry and then you almost have to sand it off. But it's a good idea. Every time you do one bay, wipe it dry, get underneath, clear it underneath also. All right, I'm hoping, uh, hey, this is really starting to look nice though. Now you can see where I had the rejuvenator repair. I don't even call it a repair. It's a little, little spot here that looks like it needed some help. A little shiny spot. There's, you're always, I don't care how careful you are. I mean, you, you, there's just, when you're looking for that last little bit, it's always a problem, and you're always going to have little high spots. Even on a foam wing, you'll probably have little high spots, but this allows you not to have to put a whole other coat of material on, but just do the spots where you've gone through. It's called spot repair. Okay, finally, we are ready to go outside, and let's do a little humidity check, see if it's going to blush. You, know, you can't tell it's been raining on and off, but it's not raining now, so we're going to hope that we can spray this. Well, it's cold out here, but at least it isn't raining, so we're going to give this a shot. Dad always do some little pieces. In this case, we did the rudder. Doesn't look like it's blushing, so we're going to take a chance and go ahead and paint today. First thing to remember, anytime it's really, really on the verge of raining, what you always want to do is do that little test. And boy, I can't say that over and over again because it takes roughly a half an hour or so before it'll come up to having that, that white film on it. And that's what you want to try to avoid, of course. Now, with each with each coat, what I try to do is back off on the pressure and add a little thinner, so that each coat gets just a little bit thinner. It's always a real big help if you can have somebody here to hold a plane for you, needless to say. But a lot of times you need, just need to make do with it. We tried it anyway. Anyway, the reason I'm trying to force this through is because I just got the weather report and it's supposed to rain for the next three or four days. Well, obviously I would like to have the plane drying in the house by a heating vent if at all possible. Notice how thin this coat is going on. Because I want to make a decision at the end of this coat, am I going to need one more coat? Or am I going to go with this? Am I going to be satisfied? Or am I just going to pick away at it? At the end of each coat, I want to know roughly where I would stand as far as being satisfied with it. The silver shows up every mistake. Mistakes you'll never see in the final coat.
rejuvenator on any of those spots. What I'll try to do is go back over them. I see one right here and give that a few extra coats just to let that soak in, get a good bond. Any spots that look like they're going to need some more sanding, just bury them in paint. Use the silver as a filler. Now, once that coat is on, and you can see that's the spot that we had. In fact, there's another spot here we need to touch up. So now I want to go back. The idea here is you don't have the same amount of paint everywhere on the plane. Parts that are going to take a beating or be under a lot of stress or tend to buff through, you want to have extra paint on them. stuff for making these little spot repairs. There's no way you can do that that I know of without that rejuvenator. That is a, a really primo little tip. Well, the next step is just let it dry out in the garage. Tomorrow we'll bring it in the house, put it by the heating vent for a few days, and then make a decision how much more little touch-ups we want to do, how much more little repairs. But so far, it's, it's shaping up real nice. Now, in the past couple of days, it has gotten completely cold outside. It is well below freezing. And I brought the, uh, the mainframe in here. Turned the heat way up in the house. You get a little idea how this is drying up. But I still want to go. It looks like we're going to get away with maybe one more sand out. Now see, this is one of the spots that we made a correction on. I want to get this on a macro lens. We made a little, I don't know if we should even call it a correction. A little, uh, right here. I, don't, I want you to see that. So you can see where the, where the tissue here, we've gotten it sanded really through. But again, we're going to pick away at this for sure using a little more rejuvenator. Any spot I see on this that has a little, especially on the leading edge, any spot, now Rejuvenator is really good at doing these kind of little touch-ups. I'm gonna to try to find another one. Here's another one. And see, if you if you didn't have this in silver, you wouldn't see that little flaw. That flaw is only apparent when you see it in silver. And that's the beauty of using the silver. And the Brodac silver is the best I've ever used by far. And I have, I have really tried to beat the system. I've tried to use auto body silvers. Now see, here's another little imperfection right around here we're gonna to try to fix. But all of these are doable. Now I'll just take a brush later. Take that little striping brush, go over that with a little rejuvenator, and then I can pick away. Again, I may want to sand this out again. Maybe I won't. This is a dry spot. Right here you can see where I've got just a little bit. There's just not enough paint there, physically enough paint. Another spot I'll want to touch up. Usually you'll get dry spots on the rib caps. Again, look right here. There's a little spot I'm not really totally happy with. Again, you have to look around. Because this trailing edge is as thin as a razor blade, it's actually a plywood trailing edge. It's so thin, I think it's going to be prone to showing up any little imperfection that I don't get straightened out there. But one of the things I do like about this, and I, you can tell I do this all the time, is look at this wing right from the front. I don't know if you can see this. It really tapers right out. It really has a kind of a Spitfire scale look. And when all those ribs are buffed and polished, boy, I think it's really going to be something special. Anyway, another little imperfection. Just trying to pick away right there. We'll get him out. That's no problem. And I'll flip it over, see what the bottom looks like here. I'm sure we're at a point each time you do this. Now, you know, obviously you could quit right now and just and leave it. That's that's probably totally adequate. But now if we decide to sand this out, sand it out in part, this is all part of a decision that has to be made. But for right now, I want to get that rejuvenator on any spot 
again, you could use clear, but the rejuvenator is so much better. Really difficult part is to go through. By the way, once you get the rejuvenator on once or twice, you can add a little thinner to it. I'm trying to make each coat, again, just a little thinner than the coat before. Being very, very selective about where I put it. Again, on a D2 plane, you probably have a different set of little edges wearing out. But it's where the edges wear out. Because if you just keep putting coat after coat after coat of paint on here, now keep in mind another side benefit of this, the rejuvenator has four or five times the amount of plasticizer in it, so it tends to keep it nice and nice and soft. It wouldn't be brittle. And each time this gets sanded out, you get more and more fussy, more and more. Yeah, at some point in time. <laughs> You just have to say, well, I'm, I only have this many hours left to work on this. That is, these are spots that if it wasn't in silver, you would never see it. Also, another thing, when you're doing this kind of work, you almost have to be under fluorescent lighting. Having incandescent lighting will mask all the floors. You want to be under fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights and silver show floors like a magnifying glass. And that's what allows you to take and make these little corrections so when you take it out in the sun it just looks perfect or well, it looks better than any other way I know of to make it see now this is one of the characteristics that Brodak Dope has and Brodak Rejuvenate you can go back with a brush some finishing materials especially lacquers when you go back over with a brush turn to chewing gum and I can see a little spot right here right here is a spot and in the final finish this will all get buried in the paint now you see this little spot this is where the problem with this is is we're on the bottom of the plane and there's this is from a rough edge in the the substrate on the wood and the tissue is having a little bit of a problem sticking in now before it gets any worse there's a real good way to do this. This is what Rejuvenator is made for in the real world. Fixing hail damage. Now what I do is take a little piece of tissue, medium weight again, just a little cheap insurance that that's not going to come through in the final coat. This is one of the little things. This is where Rejuvenator really pays off. And you'll see in two or three coats of dope, a little light sanding. That'll just get buried right in there when that dries. Now when that dries, believe me, that'll get buried. I'll put four or five coats of rejuvenator over this, let each coat dry. I have another little spot. Let me move the plane. It's easy to move the plane. Right here, there's a spot that I'm not crazy about. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to do the same thing right there. It's always easier to do these little repairs or patches. Once you see a black line, you know you have a problem. But it doesn't matter. These patches are all going to get hidden. And it's almost impossible to avoid doing this because we've got the finish sanded so thin here. If we were willing to just put on one or two extra coats of dope and leave it without sanding it, that'd be fine. But I don't want to trade the weight away. I want the weight to be in the clear on top. Now, I just want the substrate as thin as possible. Well, one of the things you can always do is just take some, a little bit of Windex and dampen the tissue also. See, my own, my way of doing this is just to press it down with my bare hand. That pushes the dough, because I'm going to sand this anyway. Now, 
that tissue will fill in with uh, maybe two, three, even five coats, and I'll be ready to sand this out. But any spot where I see a black line, where it looks like I've really got, I've got that sanded too thin, see if you never sand it, you never get these spots. Now this may be, uh, you know, even overkill here. This possibly, possibly you wouldn't even have to do this. If you want the, trying to get, in my case, I'm trying to get the quality as high as I can. These are all little tricks, by the way. If you ever go to a, well, where they're reworking on Piper Cubs up by Midgley's, we stopped and watched them do patching one day when we were up there. Boy, they do a patch. When it's all sanded out, you can't even see it. They really know how to bury those little patches. Those little spots when they're covered with paint and sanded in, they'll disappear in the final finish. Okay, I did a lot of patches on both sides. Anything that looked even marginal, I figure, what the heck? I'm going to have to sand the patches out anyway. Anyway, I'll let this dry up by a heating vent. That smells from all the camera in that little bit. And after work today, I'll work on this a little bit more. Get a couple more coats of dope on there or rejuvenate it. We'll see how those patches sand out. See if we need any other little repairs. Okay, now once these dry, and again, that's the longer they dry, the better. I'm trying to push a little bit on this. This just went on this morning. It's only drying about five or six hours. Again, I want to sand it just gently. I don't want to get too carried away here. Keep the Sickens M600, keep it wet. Just had a good talk with Bill Mazzoni. He's already finishing planes with this material and having some good luck. Now see, I can see I'm going through. I'm almost through. That's as far as I can go now. In doubt, best idea is let it dry a little extra, put a couple extra coats on. As soon as you see you're getting close to going through, that's the time to stop. In fact, at this point in time, if you're in doubt, get even a couple extra coats on. Because it's real easy to bury it in paint, but before you have enough paint on, it's real easy to go through. I just want to get the hair, really just, I wouldn't even call this a sanding, I'd call this a defuzzing. Now I'll get two or three more coats of rejuvenator on here, let that dry up. Now over the course of this day, I managed to get on three or four more coats of Rejuvenator. And I'm just going to let that sit at least overnight, maybe tomorrow, the next day. I'll sand it out and spray some silver over the patches. Now what you notice is the day after the Rejuvenator dries, you'll have, well, yeah, you'll be very surprised how easily it sands out. But you want to watch that you're not going back through to that weak spot. So I'm going right up to it. I'm trying to avoid going right onto the rib cap if I can help it. Usually three or four coats, sanded once or twice. Now it looks ugly, but once you get the first coat of silver touch-up back on, and what I'm going to try to do is get all the spots that need to be touched up on here. I'm not going to sand out the whole panel. I'm just going to sand out the spots that need to be touched up, and I can find most of them with my bare hands and then hopefully be able to go outside later today, even though it's really cold out there. Get some of the silver on here drying, and then we'll let it dry over the weekend. Yeah, I'm trying. As soon as I see that raw wood look coming through, that filler raw wood, I know I'm done. And if I do go through, 
obviously, another couple of coats of rejuvenator before I spray the silver on here. Here's what some of these, they look kind of rough before they're sanded out. When you close your eyes, if I close my eyes, I can't tell which which one is them. You see, that's the thing. You don't want to let your eyeball fool you here. What if you do it by hand, you know, look at something else. Go watch TV or something when you do this. Your hand will pick up a little error. Right now, that's almost totally buried in paint. And as ugly as that looks, when I get the silver on that, the next little touch-up, will be no problem at all. So I'm going to go by. I have a couple of spots here where I put Rejuvenator right over the, the high spot. Very carefully, I'm just going to sand out the spots that need to be touched up. I don't need to do the whole panel. Just the part that needs to be touched up. And no matter how careful you are, you'll always see little things like this. There's a little spot here and a little spot here. <coughs> kind of like a bubble where it's not really attaching real well. Usually that's from a wrinkle in the silk span that traps some air. Or you just had a fingerprint there or something where it didn't it didn't attach real well. The way you get around that is you take a brand new XL number 11 blade and just put a thousand little pinholes in it. You can see I've got all little pinholes in there. Put a little CA on it. Rub it with your bare finger or a paper towel to press it down. And now that's ready to wet sand out with some 1200. And in the next coat of silver, that should almost totally go away. Now, as awful as this looks, most people, oh, oh, you get sick when you see all these little mistakes. But when this has got the final coat of silver on it, taking care of all these little spots now, as opposed to once there's roundels painted in here, and then you go, oh, man, this is the biggest bargain. And that's what the silver does for you. It shows you all the little mistakes. It shows you even more than you need to see. But if you, if you really want to make that big run for the concourse award or some... Just upgrade your finishing skills. The easy way to do it, of course, is just put more paint on and then it'll be decoupage and the plane will be too heavy. But if you want to have that real light 7 to 8 ounce finish on the total plane, I don't know of any other way to do it other than it's just picking away and picking away and then touching up these spots. And no matter how careful you are, you're going to have spots like this. There's no way to avoid this. You're never going to paint the plane silver and, oh, it's perfect on the first shot. So what's the point? The point is to know how to fix all these little imperfections without adding a lot of weight, without adding bondo and body putty and all kind of things that are heavy. And it, mostly it's just time. Okay, one of the things worth mentioning is one of the things that, that really turns people off about the silver method is we really don't want to see these mistakes. But let me tell you, if you have the patience to go through this, this is the only way I know of. I have never found a way of just loading it up with filler or loading it up with talc or whatever. Just constantly picking away at these little areas. Except in the fact that they look pretty ratty at this point in time until we do the little touch-up of silver on there. They, they tend to look a little ratty and it's a little disheartening to people. Well, they want to see the model in a real nice shape all the time, but if you don't do this, and you were to do all of the camo paint and the riveting and everything, and then all of a sudden you see this spot come up. Ooh, now it's a real problem to touch it up. Plus, this is the only way I know of to keep the finish ultra light. And it's real easy to get a front row finish if you don't care if it weighs 10 or 12 or 15 ounces. But if, you, if you're not real careful down here in the bottom of the substrate, you're just building up weight. Just, so just like putting extra body putty on everything. It really is a nuisance. It's one of the things that you kind of have to resign yourself to is that it just takes a lot of time. And it's going to look pretty ratty at this point in time. It's going to look ratty until you get that final coat of silver on. And when I look at some of the, uh, the planes that are totally finished and I remember what they looked like in silver, boy, it used to just make me sick. I just couldn't believe us. Oh, you kind of go to bed depressed. Oh, Jesus, things are going to look terrible. Now, when you put all the paint on and you're going over a smooth substrate, piece of cake, believe me, piece of cake. A lot of people just don't like to see this. Now, what I did, I went over all the little spots again. Another little thin coat of rejuvenator. I'm going to let this dry an hour or so and then get outside. Let's see if it's not too cold to paint. It's definitely below freezing out there, but 
I want to try to shoot my little touch-up silver on this today, and then I can put it away for the weekend. Now, I did the test that I always do to check the humidity in this kind of weather. It is brutally cold. I am really freezing out here. I want it to see. This is dry to the touch already. Yeah. No fogging, so I'm not going to have to add any retarder at all. Of course, the first choice is always to never have to add retarder. Like the, as a, only as a last, absolute last resort, have to add retarder. So now I know it'll be relatively safe, hopefully safe, to bring my mainframe out here. Always give it that half hour to dry. If, if you pick up no other little tip from this video, always do a little paint test, especially if there's any question of humidity. Now you hear the sirens in the background. We have a major fire in town. I can't believe it. It's like a 10 alarm fire. <laughs> fire engines have been going past for the last half an hour. Anyway, I'm going to be a sel selectively just touch up the little spots that need attention. I don't want to paint the whole area. And that's an important, to keep the weight down, it's an important concept not to, we don't want to paint that whole thing. I just want to do the spots very selectively to cover up so that I can see if I have any errors. And if I do, I can go back, sand it out. This step that I'm doing right now, I can repeat this as many times as necessary because I'm adding virtually no weight at all. You can weigh this before and after and you wouldn't be able to pick it up on a gram scale. The tips. Even if you're painting in cold weather, leave the paint, the gun in the house, and leave, let the paint be warm anyway. It's under 30 degrees out here. It is really cold. This is why I always like to do that little test first before I come running out here, especially when you're trying to spray with low pressure. And I just want to just touch up those little areas. Now usually they're not going to go away in one coat. Put a coat on, again, give it a half an hour. If it was a little warmer, this would dry a lot sooner. It's, it's taking roughly a half hour to dry now. Just going over my patches, not putting on a full coat. See, this is where some people make the mistake. Right now, they put on a whole coat of silver or a whole coat of diamond or whatever. It's fine, and you see the planes at the nest every year. Beautifully finished when you go to pick them up and they feel like they glued to the ground. But I've made, I've made many of them. I don't want those 74,000 planes. Yeah. I know the downside of flying them, too. It's always a challenge. And if, again, another tip, if you pick this up off the tape, your stuff will be lighter. It'll be more professional looking. You know, increase your modeling skills. There's really no college course. The problem is you can't go to Rutgers or Yale or who knows what, Wyoming University, and take a course in extreme model finishing. Don't look for it in the college curriculum. It isn't there. So I try to fill that gap with the last 12 years of making videos, and I hope, I don't hope, I know people have benefited. And I see them in the front row, everybody from Casmerado to people in other countries that have a complete video library, and I get letters every day, and I'm on such an ego trip, it's ridiculous, but it isn't even an ego trip. It's an ego trip you don't need, because you know when you're doing a nice finishing job, but guys like Kent Tyser, for instance, that are learning the skills, and every year they come to the NAS very excited about their latest finish, their latest plane. And without somebody doing this legwork, believe me, this is the kind of a skill, a magazine column is fine, but if you can see it in real life, so much better. The medium of video makes this possible. Okay. 
Now as always, the trick is put it aside to dry, be patient. Some of the silk span is going to get a little soft on you. Don't panic, don't get upset. And now this last step that we just did, I'm sure I'll, when this is dry, I'll find more little mistakes. And this is the point at which you can be as fussy as you want. You know, none of this requires having a very expensive shop, tooling, milling machines, anything special. This is just hand labor, kind of like painting a Sistine Chapel in a very special way. What you need is the time and the desire to do it. And if you look at it from a lot of different angles, you'll see the silk span loosens up. In the morning it'll all be tight. You don't have to give it any thought. But the first time I remember, and it's true, first time I did one of these and I put in a little retarder and all the silk span got right, oh man, there goes that plane. Now, and in this case, again, that information, if I had this information when I was 16, 18, 20 years old, oh man, I, right now I could have been somebody. But it was very difficult to learn a lot of this. I learned most of it from Harold Price and God bless him in heaven. He was really a modeler's modeler. He really did help me out. And anybody who's been a young man without a father, you know how, how easy it is to take to somebody who's willing to spend some time and energy with you. God bless him. Anyway, we're going to let this go and uh, not be impatient. Bring it in the house, put it by the heating vent tomorrow, and hope the Jets win the game Sunday. This has been drying in the rack for two days. That, that saves a little bit of effort on my part. I know it'll sand out. Any little imperfections will sand out a little quicker. So, even though we know we can do it in a very short time, in the case where we're very busy here, I like to make it as easy as possible. Now I'm going to pull this out of the rack, look for any other little flaws, any little imperfections, any little thing I think is going to be... Uh, worth correcting at this point in time. Now I always work on the fluorescent lighting. By the way, it was nice. I got a little letter from Frank McMillan. He's about at the same stage we are, except he's using gray to do his, um, whatever you want to call it, blocking out or finding the errors, undercoat, whatever you want to call it. But now you can see one of the things silver does, it shows me all little patches. I can still see them. Now, if I was to paint right over this, believe me, you wouldn't see these. I've done that before, but because we're trying, we're trying to make a museum quality model here. We're trying to up the bar. This, this is not your average, you know, we'll just get it done and fly it to field plane. So what I'm going to do is all of these errors, I'm going to do one more sanding, one more looking around, because as soon as I, next week, we're going to start to make the flaps, the elevators, the tail, and I want to wrap this up in the next week, maybe two weeks, I'll have this wrapped up. But you can see where our rejuvenator's gone in, made us a nice patch. Again, this is the point at which you really want to be fussy. And this is the point at which a year from now you look back and you say, oh my god, I did that. Oh, jeez. Every one of the ribs is reflecting the light the way it should. When that's laying there on the floor and the lights are shining or sunlight, very important, you will see the little mistakes. So I'm going to get the 1200 paper in seconds very, very carefully. Now from this point on, it's, it's, a, it's extremely careful not to just gouge it. I want my fingernails trimmed. I'm really getting to the point where I'm happy with that coat of silver. And I want to make sure I don't sand through in any spots. I'm going to be very, very careful. By the way, the amount of silver that's on here now is almost negligible because the amount we've saved by not having a blocker coat underneath, we would need more pigmented paint on top. So in essence, the whole, the whole finish is not going to be any heavier than if we had no silver on at all. And I've proven that many times. The silver actually saves your weight by not having to go back with so much pigmented paint later on. Looking for the little spots that I can see where I've already I've already done a little touch up and just the slightest scratching. I'm not looking to sand my way through. In fact, I want to leave that little extra material around there. And if I can get out there before it's dark today, may even get another coat on here, and it could be drying out in the garage overnight. But 
again, you can go back and sand 20 coats, 30. You can do this infinitely. As long as you sand off more than you put on, you're never in trouble. And each time you do it, you know, see that, that little high spot is coming right through it. When I go to touch this up, I'll put an extra coat right on that spot. I'm trying to avoid sanding right on that high spot. These are the little touch-up deals. This is the part that's hard to figure out if you're, you're wondering how to keep that finish light. Well, you don't want to sand out the whole thing. Now, I can't feel that at all. That's, that's disappeared as, as much as anything you can expect. Final coat goes on that. You won't even be able to know which ribs were patched. see the little, the little spots that have shown up here. And the fussier you are, it'll all pay in that final coat. Now I know it's already dark out there. I'm going to try to get this shot tonight and we're coming up on the end of this tape. But I hope there's really been some good, oh, some really good little information. And I hope you'll really, you know, be able to pass this information on to other people. And by doing that, then all my efforts, or Harold Price's efforts, John Brodak's financial efforts, everybody's efforts pay off when you can pass it on and make the hobby grow. Now at this point, even if you have to mix another batch, the thing we want to avoid doing is putting any retarder into this. This retarder is going to go down and soften up the finish. So I made up a brand new batch. I'm shaking the heck out of it. I'd like to, at this point and from this point in the plane on, really at all costs, try to avoid using retarder. I also got a new hose. I'm going to, I'm getting it. I have to pick it up yet. The, that has a real, it just is a pain in the neck when you have a thick hose here. A real thin hose like an airbrush would have. That's coming. Not everybody's on same day delivery though, believe me. Now I just want to selectively do this. I don't want to just go putting on a whole coat. Very selective. Only on the spots that we get. And hey, I want to say again, thanks for joining us. Please share the information with friends. Try to bring some new people into the hobby. Once somebody feels the satisfaction of doing a really nice finish, it's, it's highly unlikely that they'll ever forget it. It's a very satisfying skill to be able to make that really beautiful, buffed out finish plane. Now all that's left is tomorrow to pull off the tin foil the next day, but we're at the end of the tape, and I really, really hope again. Well, I say it over and over again, but I really do mean it. This is such a great hobby. It's so rewarding. And yet I can remember back to the days when everything was a secret. Boy, oh boy, you couldn't find anything out. And I really, I really personally think we really missed the boat years and years ago. We could have had thousands and thousands more people, had more people been willing to just share the information. And I know myself, I was attracted to these beautiful planes that looked like they were made out of plastic or fiberglass, and I never could make one. Years went by before I could figure out how to do it. And I hope that your journey in that direction is going to be a lot quicker than mine was. And needless to say, it's already, it's already midnight outside, and we're out here painting, but it's been a fun day. is always going to look its worst when it's in silver. The whole purpose of that silver is to show you the mistakes. So don't be frustrated. Don't be disgusted. Just trudge onward. You know, it'll also be interesting to see how Frank McMillan's playing. He's a little bit ahead of me as far as the finish goes. See how his ship's coming out. A lot of people are working on this at the same time, pulling their efforts so that the hobby can have a really, really superior paint product. Yeah, it would be nice if we could go back to the old days when the dope, I don't know, when you're younger, I don't know, there's something about the smell of that dope, and boy, the dreams I had when I was younger, the dreams of someday being able to build a plane with a shiny finish, oh my God.
if you only knew. It's just, to me, a day like today, I reminisce about that. And I think it's like a dream come true. If I only could have seen it back then, it really has been a dream come true to be able to do this, to be able to make these models, and to be able to share the information. try to include a little thanks to Harold on each one of the finishing tapes I make. We're way over 700 master tapes now, and well, I'll tell you, you know, what I'm doing right now would not be possible without Harold having helped me, so just fill up my little link in the chain. A special thanks to John Brodak. Remember, this is tape two in an ongoing series in which we're going to work this I beam plane right up to the final finish. The tapes will always be available from John Brodak or from myself. See on tape three of this finishing series. It's an ongoing series of tapes. Sorry.